بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المسلمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. It's my pleasure to be with you today this night. Uh, my name is Dr. Muhammad Al-Hadi Muhammad Al-Ghazi. I am a graduate of Manchester Department University. Uh, I'm the second batch. Uh, right now I'm working as an emergency medicine registrar. My background, uh, I work in Sudan in intensive care and emergency medicine for, for, for many years and I moved to academic practice. And now I'm back to emergency medicine. Uh, right now I'm an emergency medicine registrar at Waterford University Hospital in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, 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 this webinar is going to be recorded through Zoom and through live, uh, uh, and also there is a link for uh, that's shared for for live uh, as a live in Facebook for the National Report Alumni Group. So today I'm going to be talking about the Emergency Department Preparedness Triage, the Association and Managing of Patients with COVID, and. The key point that I will cover today, so I will talk a little bit about how uh, how can we uh, make the emergency department prepared? Uh, how can we improve the search capacity? How can we prepare the personal protective equipment? Staff recruiting training. Then I'm going to talk about how can we triage patients? What triage system that we can use? And how can we decide about the patient properly? And I will move ahead to talk about how do we assess those patients and provide them with resource patients, including basic and advanced support management and airway management. Then I will continue to talk about the ongoing management of those patients in the emergency department, appropriate diagnostic test, imaging support and test management, and how do we treat hypoxia and how do we decide about who need to be admitted and who need to be discharged. And I will conclude my session about a very important common problem in Sudan, the stigma of COVID and fear. How do we mitigate them? It's a very common problem. And it's really affecting how people are, 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 are handling and responding to the government advice. If any lahza is a sort of a I will speak very fast. Please let me know in chat, okay? With the three so I would prefer to leave it to the end. We have the matalus, tamam. But that we can discuss them together. Uh, let's just start. Uh, how can we ensure that the emergency department is well prepared to handle COVID patients? Ideally, ideally, in the IE hospital, that would be a hospital team, directors, and emergency department, they need to have a meeting together. And they need to decide about how can they improve the, the, the emergency department capacity. And how can how how do they need to arrange their the emergency department physical layout? Okay. So that can be done by first decreasing the demand. And ideally, any, any hospital should discharge patients who are not really critically ill. Or if, if it's possible, like for example, hospital with a bed capacity can work as a receiving hospital, while patients who are not really in need for that service can be diverted to another hospital. And people need to defer all non-essential act activities. Yani, could the, could the, could the elective procedures should be cancelled. So one kind of surgery, orthopedics, uh, ophthalmology, all it has to be has to be deferred until we pass the crisis situation. And people need to, be, need to be more innovative in the ways that they can provide care. And if, for example, a patient's fractures, which the fractures, which is EB, then we transfer them for a fracture clinic. A patient be intubated, the orthopedic surgeon, they look at their image on the system. And if they want to consult them, they usually do a video call. So I think people need to think about having a video call. Either through phone, the telephone and ID, or through WhatsApp, or even through like, like, like a meeting, like Skype, like Zoom. All these people can use these tools to help with, with, with help continue uh, providing the care. Like many people who used to have their appointment, it can be done through a video call. So people with chronic problem 
can still have their care being delivered without interruption. People also need to think about establishing an alternate care facility, uh, which could be medical or non-medical facility. يعني مثلا الداخليات في السودان مثلا أغلب الداخليات في السودان دي ممكن تكون هي عبارة عن area of isolation تمام يعني الغرف already prepared قد تحتاج لشوية سكن لكن already in the big space ما في دراسة في جامعات هسه حاليا ممكن يستفيدوا منها في isolation isolation center تمام أغلب المستشفيات يعني مثلا 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 مستشفيات الديرماتولوجي مستشفيات الأوفثمولوجي الحاجات دي كلها قد تكون هسه حاليا السيرفيسز حقتها ما ما شغاله تمام ممكن يستفيدوا منها كاز اريا اوف كير ان هي يو نيد تو اكسباند يور اريا اوف كير از ماتش از يو كان ايفن فور ذا بيشن هو اند اب بين اديتد تو ذا هوسبيتال يو هاف تو يوز ذا ريسورسز ان 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 ا بيتر واي يعني فور اكزامبل ان ذا باست بيبول ليتس سي فور اكزامبل بيبول هو 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 كنت هاف ا ميجر اوبريشن They might get admitted for seven days until they are fully recovered and they can go home. Right now, during the corona situation, we can't do that because if you have a patient who are, are being admitted for seven days, you will occupy a bed that you need for other patients. So what you can do, instead of leaving them to stay for seven days, you can let them stay until they are, are much stable, three, four days, and then you can discharge them home But you have to arrange some sort of follow-up. You need to come back to the hospital, or you need to send a nursing team for them. You need to do some sort of 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 of, of degradation of the standards of care to to provide resources. And whatever degradation that you do, you have to document that carefully, and you have to make a clear plan to make sure that there's nothing being missed and the patient uh, quality of care is really good. And then you have to expand your bed capacity. Sometimes you have to provide treatment in unconventional location. You have to expand your staff and you have to have a clear protocols for treatment of common medical problems. So all these four uh, modality can be used to expand the search capacity. Regarding the emergency department physical layout, you need to think about your ED. You have to have two ED, so each emergency department has to be separated into two departments. You have to have a clean department and a dirty department. So the clean for patients who are unlikely to have COVID and the dirty for the patients who are suspected to have COVID. And to do that, you have to have a single triad point, and I will talk about that later on. You have to have a separate pathways for patients, which I'll explain later on. So in a simple way, if you want to improve your capacity, you have to apply all these strategies To increase your capacity, you have to rearrange your ED physical layout, and you need to have a single triage and different pathways. And also, as a part of your preparation, you have to prepare an enough amount of personal protective equipment. And if you can see this uh, image, it will show you what are the appropriate personal protective equipment. We have two levels. We have level one, PPE, and we have the, the level two, or when you have any procedures that will generate, will generate an aerosol. So for all basic clinical activities, you will need to have a, a fluid resistant surgical mask. You need to have a disposable plastic apron and a glove. And the use of eye protection should be, should be decided. You don't need to use it for any patient, but if you felt that this patient might have Uh, any black like splash of fluids or any kind of secretions, you can apply it. And for the goggles, they can be uh, they can be clean and they can be decontaminated. So if you have your own goggle, like in our department, we don't throw we don't throw them in, in, in the garbage. We have a specific pin to collect all of them, and then they tend they tend to be taken or to plate, sterilized, and we tend to re to, to reuse them again. But if you are going to a patient and you are and the likelihood that you're gonna be doing any kind of aerosol generating procedure, and I will explain that later on, then you need to have an eye protection as a shield or a goggles or a visor, and you need to have a little bit of a better mask, a respirator. And there are different kinds of masks like the FFP3 
or FFP2. There are lots of different kinds, it, and, 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 and they have different capacity of, fil of filtration. Just see what your hospital have and try to use that one. And you need to have a long sleeve with fluid repellent gown. And some people say one pair of gloves, some people say two pair of gloves. You have to look at your institute policy and all that. So basically, for any clinical activity in, 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 in which the patient, uh, like, 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 like general activity, like, like, like uh, maternity, radiology, or if you are not, like you can, speak, you can speak to the patient from a distance of two meters. For example, you want to tell him that he has been discharged. He has been admitted. You can tell him it was nice taking care of you. Simply, you don't need to put everything. You can just put a disposable gloves. You can just a plastic airplane, a surgical mask, and you don't need an eye protection. But if you're going to be involved with a patient, and there's a likelihood of aerosol gener 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 generating procedure, or it's it's a high risky area, patient is critical ill, you have to go with the level two personal protective equipment. Tamam? Level one personal protective equipment, you need a surgical mask, a plastic apron, and a gloves. And you need a footwear, a little wipeable footwear. But let's start with foot cover. Well, foot cover, it's it's controversial because like when you are removing the food cover, you might get contaminated. So many people recommend that if you if you can use a wipeable shoe, that would be better than actually having a, a, a food cover. And I believe in Sudan, that can save a cost. Instead of spending a budget on buying a food cover, it's better to buy gloves and surgical mask. Okay. If you are expecting yourself to get involved into an aerosol genera generating procedure, which are like chest physiotherapy, providing very high flow oxygen like air pool, suction, non-invasive ventilation, incubation, CDR, bronchoscopy, tracheostomy, surgery with high speed device, all these procedures have the capability of generating aerosol and there is a high risk of getting infected then you have to go for level two. So for level two, you can use either uh, uh, a, 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 a respirator, like, like, an, like an FFP3 or a different type, like an N95 or N99. There are different face marks. They have different pan. You have to be familiar with the device that you have in your hospital. And some of these devices will need a, a, a fitting test. So you have to make sure that you, you tested that device in your face and you have to make sure that it's, it's fitting well. Some of them actually might, you might need to shave your beard so they can fit very well I have. And I had to do that unfortunately. Right now I'm, I'm in holiday, so it's okay to let it go. Okay, so you have to have a long sleeve of fluid repellent disposable down, or uh, plus an eye protection. And you need to have uh, two pair of gloves and a wipeable shoe. Uh, for some places, instead of using the long sleeve fluid repellent, they can use the hazmat suit. It's a full suit, hazmat suit. If you have it, that will be lovely. If you don't have it, just go with a, even you can go with a plastic, with a plastic uh, disposable self gown. If it's fluid repellent and it's a good quality, that's just, it, 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 it can be sufficient. Doing uh, personal protective equipment and nothing, so putting on the personal protective equipment and taking it off, it's not something easy because we have never used to do that. Like the first time for us to really practice that when we get, ex when we get, we get okay exposed, at, when we get uh, prepared that, okay, we have to be ready to are expected to have lots of people with coronavirus. So all staff need to be trained on how to put and take off personal protective equipment. I have two videos here that I would like to share with you. Uh, and I hope they work well. If they didn't work well, eventually we're gonna post all these slides on the YouTube with the links for those videos so people can watch those videos at their own pace and they can review them and they can and, and they and they can practice them because anyone who's working with COVID patient, you need to be well prepared, well trained on how to apply it personal protective equipment and how to take them off. And, and in fact, 
you might not follow the guideline when you are applying the PPE, but you have to follow them when you are taking off the PPE because most of people, 35% of people who get infected, they get infected when they take off their personal protective equipment. So you have to be very careful, in, you know, when you are taking off, removing off the personal protective equipment, you have to follow the guidelines strictly and avoid any distraction because at any point you might end up being getting infected because you're not was paying, you're not paying attention to details. Okay? So let me play this video. I hope it worked for me. COVID-19, formerly novel coronavirus 2019, personal protective equipment or PPE, a guide for hospital clinical staff. This video is for hospital healthcare workers involved in the assessment and care of individuals with possible or confirmed COVID-19. It shows the type of personal protective equipment or PPE required and how to put it on and take it off safely. It covers how to put on or don PPE correctly, how to remove or doff PPE correctly and say safely, including safe disposal of PPE to avoid cross-contamination to the healthcare worker and the environment, full infection prevention and control guidance and illustrated written guidance on putting on and removing PPE is available as part of the PHE COVID-19 guidance collection on gov.uk. This donning and doffing guidance is specific to COVID-19. Safe systems of working. PPE is just one part of safe systems of working. Only clinical staff who are trained and competent in the use of this PPE should be allowed to enter the patient room. Healthcare workers must be familiar with local operational arrangements for the safe care of patients with possible COVID-19. Hospitals need to identify areas for safe donning and doffing of PPE. Safe systems of working, including the correct use of PPE, will help protect you and others against infection. This is Cecilia and Chaba. Cecilia will be donning the PPE and Chaba will be her buddy for demonstration purposes. Where possible, the process should be supervised by a buddy at a distance of two meters. The buddy must be a member of staff also trained and competent in the use of this PPE. The buddy can assist the person putting on the PPE and perform a final visual inspection of the PPE ensemble, making any adjustments as necessary. If a buddy is not available, please follow the instructions and check each step is completed correctly. The recommended PPE components. Gown. Alcohol hand rub. Gloves in the correct sizes. Visor goggles, respirator, or respiratory protection. Here are the recommended PPE components in more detail. A long, rear-fastening, fluid-resistant, long sleeve surgical gown in the correct size. A fit-tested FFP3 respirator. There are a number of approved respirators, and here are just two examples. A disposable full-face visor or goggles, and gloves in the correct size. Before putting on PPE, perform hand hygiene. Pre-donning instructions. Ensure healthcare worker is hydrated. Tie hair back. Remove jewelry, so no stoned rings, watches or bracelets, etc. And check PPE is in the correct size and available. Clean hands with alcohol, hand gel or rub. Step 1. Put on a long, rear-fastening, fluid-resistant and long sleeve disposable gown. Do not use the inside tie, but fasten the necktie with Velcro and then the waist ties. Make sure the gown is securely fitted at the neck and waist ties. If glasses are worn, remove glasses before Step 2. Put on disposable FFP3 respirator and check for fit. This must be the respirator that the healthcare worker is face fit tested to use. The FFP3 respirator must be compatible with other facial protection. your full face visor. 
If you have not been fit tested for the FFP3 respirator, you must not enter the patient's room. Position the upper straps on the crown of your head, above the ears and the lower strap at the nape of the neck. Ensure that the respirator is flat against your cheeks. With both hands, mould the nose piece down from the bridge of the nose, firmly pressing down both sides of the nose with your fingers until you have a good facial fit. Always perform a fit check before entering the work area. A successful fit check is when there is no air leaking from the edges of the respirator. For an unvalved product, exhale sharply to test. For a valved product, inhale sharply. If air flows around the nose, readjust the nose piece. If air flows around the edges of the respirator, readjust the headbands. If you still cannot obtain a successful fit check, do not enter the work area. Once the respirator is fitted, replace the glasses before fitting your face protection. Step 3. Put on your eye protection. A disposable full face visor is preferred. Goggles may be used if a visor is not available. If using a visor, ensure it covers all of your face, including your chin. Adjust the headband if necessary. If a buddy is not available, you will need visual confirmation that the visor is in the correct position. Step 4. Put on a pair of non-sterile nitrile gloves. These need to be available in the correct size. Ensure the gloves cover the cuffs of the gown completely. You should now check all items are in place. الفيديو الصوت بتاعه كان واضح ولا ما كان واضح لو واضح يا ريت توريني في الشات انه واضح ولا ما واضح COVID-19, formerly novel coronavirus 2019, the correct order for removal and disposal. The video very clear, please. As we said, you know, the donning is important, but the doffing is much important. I know we get infected if we didn't do it properly. Again, I know, you know, the video is going to show you a monotonous style speech. That means, I believe, the very important fact. Also, yeah, also, it seems that you know, he has to go through a, a specific step. We come to attend the video, but I must patient. You have to practice to practice. You have to ensure that there's somebody is correcting you so you can make sure that you are safe because if you got infected, you will infect the other patient, you will infect your colleague, and you will infect your families, which is even worse. Proposal of Personal Protective Equipment or PPE. Where possible, the process should be supervised by a buddy at a distance of two meters. The buddy must be a member of staff also trained and competent in the use of the PPE. The buddy can assist the person doffing the PPE. This is to reduce the risk of the healthcare worker removing the PPE and inadvertently contaminating themselves while doffing. Preparing to remove PPE. Removal of PPE should be completed as follows. Do not step into the clean area wearing contaminated PPE. If aware of any PPE breach or high exposure contamination to PPE, inform the buddy before removing any PPE. This is Cecilia, who is donned in full PPE. Refer to the donning video for full instructions. Removing PPE, step one. The outside of the gloves are contaminated. 
To safely remove the gloves, the healthcare worker will grasp the outside of the glove with the opposite gloved hand, peel off, hold the removed glove in the gloved hand, The healthcare worker now slides the fingers of the ungloved hand under the remaining glove at the wrist. They then peel the remaining glove off over the first glove and dispose of the gloves in the clinical waste bin. Now clean your hands with alcohol, hand gel or rub. Removing PPE Step 2 the gown should be removed slowly and carefully. First undo the necktie, then undo the waist tie. Now pull gown away from the neck and shoulders, touching the inside of the gown only using a peeling motion, as the outside of the gown will be contaminated. Finally, turn the gown inside out, fold or roll into a bundle, and discard into the waste bin. Removing PPE Step 3 To remove the visor, stand straight, do not bend forwards, as this brings the bottom of the visor in contact with the clean upper body. Reach for the elastic strap at the back of the head, close your eyes, and lift the strap upwards then over the head using both hands. Place the visor into the clinical waste bin. Now leave the patient room wearing your respirator. Now clean your hands again with alcohol, hand gel or rub. If glasses are worn, remove the glasses before doffing the respirator. Clean them with an alcohol wipe. Do not put them back on until you have completed doffing and washed your hands. Removing PPE Step 4 After leaving the patient room, carefully and slowly remove the FFP3 respirator without touching the front of the respirator which is contaminated. To do this, reach to the back of the head with both hands to find the bottom strap and bring it up to the top strap. Then lift both straps over the top of the head. Let the respirator fall away from your face and drop into the clinical waste bin. Now that all PPE has been removed safely and placed in the clinical waste bin, you can step out of the designated... Okay. Uh, and obviously, uh, as a part of your preparation to handle the COVID pandemic, you have to ensure that you have enough staff, you have to train them well, and you have to ensure their well-being. So how to recruit staff? Basically, obviously, the, you you need to use the available specialty so people from other specialty like from orthopedics from surgery from uh from dermatology from ophthalmology they have to be given the choice either to join anesthetic surgical care or an emergency department and the, if you are in first situation they have to be diverted they have to be trained but if your situation is still like manageable and you, and you don't really need to recruit them you have to train them meanwhile so you have to make sure that you have enough staff, you have to recruit them, you have to train them. And probably in a future webinar, we're gonna share with you lots of available online resources that have been designed to help people get ready to handle COVID in the emergency department or in the ICU. Staff well-being is really very important. And if you just look at this link from the Intensive Care Society from the UK, it's really important matter like handling, uh, handling the COVID epidemic, uh, like handling the rush of patients, the different aspects of care, the stress that we, we face as a frontline provider, it's really gonna affect everyone. 
So you will need to take care of yourself and take care of your colleague and your hospital and your senior should take care of you. Uh, our colleague, Dr. Fawaz, has a nice presentation about how can we take ourselves during the COVID pandemic. I would recommend anyone in that room. Uh, and people they need to send support. Yani, when people depressed or sad, we don't share it with them, which is a problem because it built up. It built up even if you are not, if you don't look depressed right now, eventually you might get, uh, you might get burned. Or eventually you might even leave the career. You, you just, it's not really, it's, it's really tough. It's not, it's not easy. So people should be well supported so they can do their best during this time. Was support my psychological best had a young in the team and necessity. This my no longer said the cutters and mom must have fared. Maybe you must have said, Maybe you must have to hell. Always not high. That's simply be afraid. The Nasdaq has in life enough personal protective equipment. The fee transportation leha in the hospitals will be with that my lockdown or half of the Sudan. A kid, many people will turn over. You have most people, so they can so you can provide a really good, a decent, decent uh, care. Okay, so we can let me look at how to prepare your emergency department. Uh, I can let now look at how to triage the patients. Uh, you can provide any emergency uh, uh, medical services. You do make kind of triage. It's impossible. It's one of the biggest problems in Sudan. In the market effective triage uh, points, the available uh, hospital. But let's talk a little bit about triage. Term triage here as well is a French term from trier. It means how to how to it means uh, to sort out how to sort out patient. So if you want to do triage, it has to be done by one of the healthcare team. In most of the British and the Irish hospitals, triage is done by the nurses. Sometimes during epidemics, or if the cases are critical, they might ask the input of a senior doctor. If you want to do a really good triage, you have to have a security support. Is that Mr. Fair? Can I am with the left country COVID for the month COVID? You have to have a security. That's really important. But I think that would depend on the porters. The porters are going to help you. Taking a patient's inside the department, patients with a wheelchair, patient with a trolley, so you need porters to help you. Usually, in routine days, we used to allow caregiver to go with the patient. But during the COVID outbreak, we did not allow any caregiver to join the patient. Unless the patient is a minor, I'm going to go to our or he is having dementia, so he can't express himself. So it's very important during the COVID pandemic, shouldn't allow caregiver to go into the hospital. It has to be clear. Only the patient himself should come inside. With system has a bit of a triage, the same as Manchester triage system. And they who are based on observations, the ULP and vital signs or patient complaint, we triage a patient in one of five categories. Patients who are immediate, they have to be seen immediately. Patients who are very urgent should be seen in 10 minutes. Patients who are not urgent can wait up to like an hour. Patients who are standard can wait up to two hours. Can I can add in for the second? Multiple in two hours to say action to be seen. Hey, they are the giving given a long waiting time. When that's like a turbo, they have to be very slow. They don't have to be very slow. They know you know, you know, the quality of care. If you don't have really urgent issue, then you have to wait. So, and it's unethical for us to see people who are standard before the urgent or people who are urgent before the very urgent. So we have to go and see the sickest patient first. And during the triage, we have a special triage system. That it will help us to decide. As I mentioned before, in the physical layout, our emergency department has been divided into two new emergency departments. We have a clean emergency department and we have a dirty emergency department. So the people who are really COVID or could be COVID, they go to the dirty, or we, we, we call it, we, we give it a political, a political name, we call it the yellow, the yellow ED. While people who, who are 
stable or unlikely to be COVID will send them to the green area. So how do we sort them out? So we go with a, with, with a simple questioning. So we ask any patient, do you have any new cough? Do you feel restless? Do you have fever or high temperature? Have you been in contact with a patient, with a person who suspect or confirm, confirmed COVID? Do you have any diarrhea or anorexia? Have you had any swab taken before or not? And because we know that some, sometimes patient might not tell you the truth or might not give you the information clearly, we also check for the respiratory rate should be less than 20, temperature should be less than 38, there should be no signs of check infection or no evidence of red eye. If there is any suspicion that this patient has any one of these tick yes, any one of them, then we have to assume this patient is having COVID. So immediately once we, we made that assumption, the nurse who is doing the triage, usually she is usually wearing a mask, she's having a gloves and a plastic apron, and some of them might wear the COVID. So if she tries this patient as query COVID, she would ask the patient to put a surgical mask immediately, and he need to go to the COVID ED and he need to be in an isolated room. So the COVID ED is divided into a cubicles, into rooms, and ideally they have to be a negative pressure rooms. If the patient doesn't have any one of these, then okay, this patient is unlikely to be COVID, he's having chest pain, he's having abdominal pain, he's having a different problem, so he will go for non-COVID area. And obviously, as you can see with this kind of triage, we tend to over triage people, but it's better to assume that those people are having COVID initially and to approach them like that, then, then rather than to send them to the non-COVID area and to get many healthcare providers get exposed to them until you discover later on, oh, we missed that patient, he was a COVID patient, and now we have many healthcare providers who get exposed to this patient and they have to be sent for quarantine. So again, in our emergency department, we have two EVs. We have two emergency departments. We have the clean or the green ED. We have the dirty or the yellow ED. And the tool that we choose to decide which of which we go with this kind of algorithm. Okay, let's assume that we have a patient who came, he's 45, he's having a dry cough, his respiratory rate is high, and he's febrile. He has been seen by a triad nurse, and then it has been decided that this patient is clearly COVID, and he to be sent to the COVID ED, and has been placed in a room. So we have to assess him and give him resuscitation if we need. So as my colleague mentioned in, in their presentation, so there are common symptoms of COVID and, non -com, non, and, and other less common symptoms. Again, according to our tool, if we have any one of these parameters, then we assume this patient is having COVID. Let's say that this patient has been, has been usually, usually the patients are being escorted by security to, to one of the isolation room in the emergency department, and they will wait there until they get assessed by a nurse and a doctor. And usually the nurses approach them before us as a doctor. They go inside, they do their vital signs. Some of the good nurses help us place in the line, put them on a full monitor and do the investigation for us. But we might also help with that. It depends on how busy is the ED, and it depends on who goes with the patient first. So, before you approach the patient, remember that patient is clearly COVID, is a potentially infectious patient to you. So the less time that you spend with the patient, the likelihood that you will get infected with the COVID. So before you go inside, you have to have as much information as much as you can. In our system here, we use the electronics medical system. We check the record, previous medical admission, we get further information. In Sudan, it might be difficult, but you can still ask the caregiver, okay, this patient has been sent as COVID. Try to know as much as you can before you go inside. And sometimes when the nurse go before us and they see the patient and they feel that the patient is stable, we don't approach the patient. We let them do the plot and send the plot, and we don't go and see the patient until we get the results. If get a point, you know, in the kitta, 
إذا إذا possible carry as much information على الفيشن قبل ما تشوفه بيكون أفضل. Your personal safety is important. فلا بد أن تخطط لأبوبيت بيرسونال بروتكتيف إكويبمنت. وزي ما قلنا we have to minimize the risk by minimize number of staff and touches. يعني البيشن ما ما بشوفه أكثر من two one doctor and one nurse. We usually try our best to reduce the number of visits. يعني مثلا في الـ في الـ في الكونفنشنال اي بي في الايام العاديه الايام بشوفها هاوس اوفيسر الهاوس اوفيسر والله شك في حاجه بنقدر نجسرها نشوفه معه بعد شويه والله الناس تيجي تعمل اسسمنت للعيان الناس ثانيه تيجي تعمل اسسمنت للعيان في كميه من الناس بيخشوا وبيطلعوا العيان دي حاجه عاديه لكن during الكوفيد it has to be planned somebody should go do the assessment come back ما بتحب ناس كثار يمشوا ويطلعوا من العيان by doing that احنا we are saving the person protective equipment أمن استهلاك كثير، وreducing the risk of infection، تمام؟ وstream وstream line the patient care. You go with the ABCs. Check the airway. Has the patient airway patient or not? The oxygen if needed. Circulation. Provide the access. Take note for investigations. Do an ECG. For COVID, then we have to tell them later on we don't give fluids and it's really important. Check their neural status. Are they conscious or unconscious? Expose them to obvious rash, to obvious other sort of infection, whatever. Do a quick history and examination. During that time, my COVID patient, you need to take a detailed history, detailed examination. Try to rationalize any haja. Try to be focused as much as you can, as to protect yourself, to protect others, and to be more efficient. If you think that this patient is having any life-threatening problem, you have to detect them. And to treat them, they may go now. Any patient with respiratory tract infection, it might be COVID. And if they have a patient with asthma, we're going to assume this patient is COVID and be proven otherwise. But we have to treat that asthma. We have to give him steroids. We have to give him antibiotics and neutralize it. So if he has a high level threatening, you have to treat him as soon as uh, as possible. Or we'll soon neutralize it. Then the doctor will like, okay, the patient has asthma that might be very sick. We usually prefer to give them a little inhaler, mild spacer, command. Like the whom very sick, blood pressure, asthma. We don't have choice. We go with level two personal protective equipment, and we give them full neutralization and full treatment. We order essential investigations, and if you think this patient is gonna need an intubation, you have to call for critical care early. They might tell them later on an intubation of the COVID patient not easy process. So it's better to be done as planned as much as we can than to be rushing and uh, while the patient is crashing. So if you think the patient is not doing well, call them early, let them come, assess the patient and decide if they're going to face this patient or not. Okay, so let's assume that this patient become very unstable and he arrested and you have to provide CBR for him. Again, we have to follow a UK or European Research Council guideline. Well, guidelines at the research station are the same. The only difference that we have that before if you start doing any CBR, you have to ask yourself, does this patient will get the benefit from the CBR or not? So if you are suspecting this patient is having COVID, he is extremely elderly patient, like 75 or more. He's have multiple comorbidities, CCF, diabetes, and acute kidney injury. And his baseline functions is very poor. This patient is unlikely going to make it from CBR or intubation or mechanical ventilation. So you have to decide about okay, we, we won't be able to provide CBR for him. We have to think of ending his life. But if you have an, a, 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 a middle age or a young patient without significant comorbidities, and I will talk about that later on, then you have to proceed with the, with with the, with you have to proceed with the resources, and you have to keep in your mind few changes. So when you are doing the CPR, when you are assessing for breathing, don't come close to the patient because he might infect you with the virus, okay? Attach defibrillators. Do the CPR according to the algorithm. Make sure that everyone is having level two personal protective equipment. Airway management in COVID patient is a very difficult task. And to do that, you have to follow a checklist. And this is example, one of the checklists that are used for managing COVID patients. And I know that checklist is very busy. 
and I won't go through that checklist, but I will show you tools and I will conclude with a video that will explain everything in a nice way. So let's assume that in the kitty you have a patient who is a COVID, who is unstable, and this patient might need an airway management. So if, if you think that, you have to bring the airway to leave or the airway back. So what does the airway back should include? So many people, they develop many checklists that can help us plan for the airway management and prepare a better airway back. Let me share with you this video. So as you can see, this is a checklist to tell you how to prepare a proper intubation back. circuit the uh the uh, uh, you can use just a, 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 a normal bag valve mask oxygen that's okay not a big difference uh it's not a difference it's not a big difference So, so we can have it in a trolley. We can have it in a trolley. So at the top of the trolley, then the hajadi, the who are the gel forceps, the some more eye gel. Uh, you can use the laryngeal mask, the mandic eye gel, into the tube, my syringe, uh, bougie, uh, a normal laryngoscope, a video uh, laryngoscope is better if you have it. Uh, the the the, the style, sorry, the bougie, yeah. The style to the bougie. Of the bottom floor, then you have connections, have the ventilation, and the whole in a closed suction system, my back valve mask, my McGill forceps, my NG tube, and I am by the intubation for what it will be NG tube. Let you by the intubation. They may go to intubation with the through a checklist. One action is simply I like to make it easy for you. It's as the same people who designed that checklist. They made a really nice video for a simulation for how to go through that checklist. This video is going to be a little bit long, nine minutes, but it's going to make it very clear for everyone on how to manage the airway for a COVID patient. And I would really recommend that in, in every department, we need to have a simulation because if you are not prepared mentally for that, it's going to be difficult for you to apply this skills on a real patient. <laughs> Can every, every now and then be a donor simulation in the into team leader, into team member, and the COVID patient. We have time machine. But because they see how do you follow the checklist, how do you afford the patient, and they, and they give you feedback about your performance.
This video demonstrates a simulated endotracheal intubation using the OUH checklist for intubation of critically ill patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. This checklist is an adaptation of the OUH standard checklist for intubation of critically ill adults, but with small adaptations to maximize the safety of staff and patients when there is suspicion or a confirmed diagnosis of infection with COVID-19. So we're outside the room of patient X uh, who requires intubation and we're going to go through the COVID-19 tracheal intubation checklist. I'm going to start off by confirming um, the recess status of the patient. The patient's were recess. And Trevor, does the patient have any allergies? No, no, no allergies. So we're going to start by uh, allocating roles in the team. So I'm going to be the airway lead, the most senior airway doctor. Trevor, if you're happy being the airway assistant, Tori, if you could be the second airway doctor uh, and be in charge of drugs and monitoring. Mm -hmm. And Laura, could you be the first runner? So donned in full PPE but outside the room um, and you're um, in charge of accessing further kit if we require it, in particular front of neck access. Yep. And there's also a second runner who's not donned and is in the clean area who you can communicate with if need be. So we're going to move on to the preparation. So uh, we prepared drugs um, and Tori if you could just go through what you've prepared please. Yep, so we have an induction agent, we've got 100 milligrams of rocuronium, we've got a vasopressor and a saline flush. We've also got our recess drugs ready and available. And Laura, if you wouldn't mind getting ready the post-intubation sedation. Okay, so we're going to go through the equipment. So this is all pre-prepared. On the intubation trolley. And this is going to go into the room with us. So we have a face mask, Goodell, we have a water circuit with inline suction, HME filter and catnography, which have been pre-arranged. We have two endotracheal tubes. We have lubricant, a syringe, an eye gel, an ETT clamp and gauze. We have a video laryngoscope and MAC4. We have a stylet and bougie available. And we have an NG tube and McGill's forceps. Of note, the front of neck access pack is outside the room and can be accessed from the airway trolley. Okay, so we're going to move on to the airway plan. So um, we're going to give the induction agent and rocuronium together, Tori. And I will be holding the face mask on as pre oxygenation and I'll be avoiding face mask ventilation during that time. Plan A will be a tracheal intubation with a video laryngoscope, and I'm going to use a bougie. I'll have a maximum of three attempts and uh, if failing, I'll declare a failed intubation, at which point, Trev, if you could communicate to Laura outside of the room to access the front of neck access pack and to bring that into the room. So plan B to maintain oxygenation will be an eye gel, and failing that, we'll move on to bag mass ventilation, which will be a two-handed, two-person technique. So I will maintain the airway, and if you're happy to ventilate. If we fail at that, I'll declare a can't intubate, can't oxygenate situation and we'll move on to plan D, which is front of neck access. So at that time, uh, if you're happy, we can swap roles. So you will come around and um, hold the airway and I will be performing the front of neck access. Yeah. Following successful uh, intubation, um, we are, need to ensure that we have a um, secure airway before ventilating. So Trevor, I want you to inflate the cuff while I attach the water circuit and I'm not going to ventilate the patient until I'm happy that the cuff is uh, inflated. Okay, does that all make sense? Yep. Everyone happy with the plan? Yep. Okay, so uh, it's time I think we can move in inside the room. Okay, so now we're going to go through the inside the room checklist. So we're just going to go through three checks before um, drifting off to sleep. Yep, so patient optimization. So Ben, are you happy with patient positioning? Yep. And you confirmed front of neck access site? Yep, confirmed. And we've got our monitoring established. So we've got our ECG, we've got our SATs, we've got our blood pressure and our end tidal CO2. We've got our face mask, inline suction, HME filter, capnography and water circuit. I'm just going to switch this mask over now, sir. So I'm going to turn the, off the oxygen to the non-rebreathe mask just to minimise aerosolisation and replace it with the face mask, which I'm going to secure with two hands. 
So we're going to consider a vasopressor and fluid bolus if needed, and aspirate an NG tube if there is one. So now we're going to go on to our pre-intubation check. So Trev, are you happy the IV access is working? And that's working well. Ben, is your suction on and under the pillow? Yes. Trevor, you happy with ventilator settings and our sedation for post-intubation? Yeah, they're all set up. And we've already confirmed our drug doses and we've written them on the whiteboard. Okay, so we've adequately pre-oxygenated. So, so we're just going to drift you off to sleep now, okay? Okay, if everyone's happy, yep. we're happy to give the induction agent. Yep, so induction agent going in. I'm going to give 100 milligrams of rocuronium. And I'm just going to flush that in now, and we'll start timing for a minute now. And I'm not going to uh, hand ventilate the patient unless clinically indicated. And that's 50 seconds. Okay, so if I could have the video laryngoscope, please. Okay, and the bougie, please. So, an ET tube. Okay, have you got the bougie? Yep. Okay, tube in. So, bougie out, please. Thank you. And cough completed. Okay. Confirm clinically, we have bilateral chest movement and we have end tidal CO2. Okay, so if we could secure the tube, it's at 20 centimetres at the teeth and we're also going to place an NG tube. Thank you. Okay, if we could secure that at uh, 64 centimetres at the nostril. Okay. All right. So now we're going to proceed to transfer uh, to the ventilator. So we're going to turn down the oxygen to the water circuit. We're going to clamp the ET tube before we break the circuit and then we're going to disconnect the water circuit from the capnography, connect to the ventilator and then unclamp the ET tube before we start ventilation. Okay. Everyone happy? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, water oxygen's down. ET clamp. Okay, we've disconnected. Connected to the ventilator. If you could unclamp the tube and start ventilator. Okay, and we are ventilating the patient. So we'll start some sedation, insert a central line and an arterial line, and then dispose of any dirty equipment. لو لاحظنا لو لاحظنا الفيديو ده تمام يعني غير ان هم ماشوا بخطوات الجزء اول كمان كانوا فيري كوتشس ان هم تو افويد يعني دون ال 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 بيوسيشن واز اكسسيف باجين لانه اكسسيف باجين كان كان جنريت ايرسولز اند كان بريسبوز تو انفكشن 
presentation بتاع كان بتبوس ساتوريشن ما في داعي تعمله لكن اذا كان بتشوف بتاع فيري هايبوكسي يو دونت هاف تشويس يو هاف تو دو ات بعد ذاك هم لما كانوا بيحولوا الفيشن من التيوب مع الباد بالف ماسك للبنكريت السيركت زي كلام بالتيوب تمام كويس ده كله عشان يمنعوا الكروس انفكشن بعض الناس هنا في المستشفى بتاعتنا لما نعمل انكيوبيشن نوصل العيان مع البنكريت مباشره تمام So we don't need to clamp a tube or we don't need to clamp a tube. Okay. The ongoing management of patients, come on, please. We see investigations, we see investigations, they may refer to my colleagues in the previous lecture. This is the relevant investigations for any patient who is query COVID. But that also we have to think of taking a swab. In my hospital, if we don't do a swab, the patients are becoming admitted, come on. وريشنا حق حق البوليسي دي احنا ما عايزين البيشنتس كلهم يجونا في المستشفى فور تيستينج اي بيشنت هو موست لايكلي تو بي ديسشارج هوم وهو ستيبل ما بنعمل له سوا يمشي المست... يمشي يمشي البيت وهي كونتاكت البرايمري هيلث كير تيم هم زي ارينج فور تيستينج فور هيم بوك كلشرز ويورين كلشر از انديكيتد بنعمل ابروبريت بوك تيست سواء كان فايرال ولا بكتيريا تيستينج Well, imaging work it will help. In this case, imaging. A chest X-ray is very important. We usually, if a COVID patient with X-ray, have get to maybe a patient for consolidation, or if you prefer consolidation. Or initially, as the admission, you might see some changes, but the more the patient deteriorate, you see the classic picture until you see the full clinical picture of ARDS. The main doctor we have had killer in details on how to interpret, uh, uh, how to request and how to interpret an image for patient with query COVID. Recently, a bedside ultrasound is a very important tool. So, if you have the facility, if you still have the ultrasound, you can use it. But this is a lot of people with contamination or decontamination of the device. It makes it difficult for us to do it on every patient. لكن in a normal patient لما تعمل chest ultrasound خليني اشغل ال 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 pointers اوكي ده normal ultrasound لما تخط ال ultrasound اللي بتشوف ال broad هنا ده في ال lung تمام ال ribs ما بتوصل ليك ال imaging كويس فال black ده shadow بتعرف وده shadow بتعرف ودي هي ال lung tissue في ال normal lung tissue بتبقى في white line شايفين ال line ده بيسموها الـ A lines. ففي من normal lung لما تعمل lung ultrasound بتشوف الـ ribs as a black shadow والـ lung tissue as فيه white line بنسميها الـ A line. بعد ذاك برضه شايف دي الـ rib وده الـ rib shadow هنا ده دي rib ثانية وده الـ rib shadow هنا ده ودي white line. بعد ذاك في حاجة بسموها الـ sliding sign. ال 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 الاحتكاك ما بين ال parietal and visceral fluid بيعمل sign بيسموها the sliding sign we can see it clearly the normal ultrasound the normal patient the patients in the covid ما بيكون in the A line بيكون in the B line the B line بيكون هي شنو اللي هو شنو بيكون هي ااا ما هو vertical line و very deep line تمام So the more B lines that you see, the more the more severe disease. So we can diffuse wide B line, but not to diffuse long B lines. So the the tool we use in the hospital, okay, it makes it easy for us to to write investigations or medications or plan the care pathway. Of course, a pneumonia usually is sharp within seven days from onset of symptoms. Uh, patients and end respiratory failure, they have to, they have to get you to ICU. Uh, yeah, and we have to start supportive treatment early. Supportive treatment, oxygen is very important. Uh, so we have to give the patient oxygen to keep the saturation more than 95. Uh, if they are not to have COBD or chronic disease, we have to go for 88 to 92. Fluids, we have to be conservative. If there is no shock, don't give fluids for patients with COVID disease because obviously, If the patient is having severe COVID disease and you give him fluids, that will make his condition worse. Giving him an analgesic paracetamol is very important. And do not ever forget to consider giving them some sort of venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. In fact, people now are talking about does the anticoagulant have a, a beneficial role? We have a trial in Ireland 
to treat the COVID people with anticoagulant. I should show you how do they improve because some people believe that a powerful physiologic type COVID is related to, to, to throw small imply in the lungs that would, would lead to development of ARDS. Antibiotics. So in ED, we give all patients empiric antibiotics according to our local protocol and we give it with an hour of presentation. Lacking as soon as our blood test shows that in leukocytes, not a significant CRP elevation, where for patient COVID, there's no need to continue antibiotics, but the antibiotics and the side effects. So you have to consider de escalation. But patients who are immunocompromised, patients who have the steroids in the different conditions, they might benefit from antibiotics. People who are hypoxic uh, and stressed, they might need to involve the ICT early. So when we started the COVID pandemic, we have been advised not to provide non invasive ventilation. In any patient with COVID, incubate or can I give initial guidelines. The question is, okay, but any patient with pure COVID to end up being incubated, we don't have capacity for this. So people rethought that again, and people now are encouraging using non invasive ventilation, our high flow or a well high flow oxygen device. Managed to done and especially the air machine actually to them. But the second, in a line respect of type one, might have to do by back. You have to give him CPAP. For safety, you have to give a CPAP in a room with a negative pressure. As in the aerosols, and which has been general, generalized, you have to find a space. You have it has to be evacuated outside the room to prevent the cross infection. Uh, if you're if you're gonna ventilate this patient, you have to go with full PPE level two, and you have to go with with aerosol ge generation procedure precautions. So how do you manage hypoxia in COVID patient? So you start. It depends on how the patient. It depends on the patient deterioration and the recovery. So you start with the basic thing. Give the patient uh, a low flow nasal cannula. You can go up to six liters. Once you realize that you are at six liters and this patient is not really improving from that, this patient most likely is going to end up deteriorating. So dependent on your resources, if he is hypoxic, you can use the CPAP or the ERVO, the high flow nasal cannula. In Sudan, the market high flow nasal cannula, the second option for CPAP. Then you can try awake groaning, that will help. So if you have a patient must take gap of a contraindication, you have to go to the invasive mechanical ventilation. The patient is in the ICU, which is ICU. Or for the ICU, people, they have to try the browning so they can help with the ventilation. If you have a center, we don't have a lot of time, we don't have a lot of time. People can try an ECMO, the extracorporeal uh, membrane of oxygenation. Which is the ECMO in the resource intensive. So if you tell them in the case of the epidemic, it's unlikely that it will be useful. For example, in the case of the ordinary, when you have a limited patient, you can offer them the ECMO. But if you have, for example, 40 patients, they will take the ventilator, the bronchi, and they need ECMO. You can't, it's very resource intensive, so you won't be able to offer the ECMO for anyone. And patients who really end up needing ECMO, they have very high mortality, unlikely they can make it. Especially local local in the home, lots of comorbidities. But that you have to manage hypertension in what is an hypertensive to give fluids conservatively. Is a mechanical response you have to think of vasopressors. You have to involve lysium. I'll follow up the patients. The tools we use them are Britannia and Edenda. The Britannia we call the National Air Warning Response System. The Irish we call the Irish National. يعني أيضاً بسموها الآي نيوز، الفتش بسموها النيوز. سواء كان الاثنين هم the same parameter بس اختلاف اسماء ما أكثر من كده. وكلهم زي depend على ال vital signs و how ال vital signs دي arrange دي normal parameter. ال patients اللي عنده normal vital signs بيكون عنده score zero. عنده normal respiratory rate, normal saturation, on, on air only. Normal systolic blood pressure, normal heart rate, and his alert with normal temperature. Is the temperature that it? Oh, not the salt, come on. The cooler abnormal. 
and based on how low and high a patient react the score, we, and we calculate the total score. Kulum score per patient can high, kulum and the more critically ill. What will be very helpful in nurses, and what nurses are just random about critical ill, that you can make them get this for the appropriate diagnosis. Yeah, I'm not having exactly much kill away, Tamam, that you can end up random about the cactus, like you have much kill, Tamam. And everyone is called to do a guide. And in the case of the doctor, the doctor is going to be a score of 3 or more, and the patient is going to be a score. It will help a clinical judgment. And any hospital has a system of escalation. And if the doctor is going to be a score of 1 or 2, then the doctor is going to be very stable. And the observation can be done every 6 hours for them. But if the doctor is going to be a score of 3 or more, يحتاج فريكونت اوبزرفيشن واذا السكور بتاع الفيشن وصل 7 الفيشن ده لابد ان تبي ايفالويتد باي كريتيكال 3 لازم يشوفوا وزي ديسايد على عنده عايز وش الانترفينشن ده في مي عشان تبريفنت عشان سو سو ذي كان بريفنت ذا ديتيريشن اند ذي كان ديسايد اباوت سم مانجمنت سو هو وات 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 بيشن شود بي ادميتد اي بيشن بي ايل وور ان سكور مور ذان 3 if you think that this patient is going to deteriorate based on your judgment, and with the kind of psychological circumstances, the patient that he can't self-isolate himself and he can't take care of himself. Comorbidities, elderly, people with cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, chronic disease, with constant immunosuppressive, those patients usually will end up having bad outcomes. The UK is a developed a decision support tool based on an age, based on a trial to scale, or comorbidities. But accordingly, due to the IAM score, or according to the score, they will decide the outcome or management of the IAM. Obviously, if patients come at time to high points, it means that in a patient that more quality have it too high, then let's get to the palliative care on that patient. While well, patient with a low score, they can penalty from intensive care management. Those patients that can escalate their treatment quickly, they can intubate them early and send them for ICU quickly and early. Well, as we know, new disease usually take 14 days, when most deterioration be absolved by the first seven days. So the first seven days from the onset, the patient usually tend to be admitted between 10 and uh, between 10 and 14 days, he develops a distress, and those patients can recover after that, or they can deteriorate and develop all the complications. How to mitigate the stigma and fear? Probably a very big problem in Sudan. There are many reasons uh, it, it, it leads to the problem. I can say how it's a big problem. In, and as they stigmatize a COVID disease, but they affect a community and not how to have to deny symptoms. They don't seek a healthcare system support early. Or even when they go, they don't tell the people the truth and they don't follow doctor advice. But you can have a lot of We are not alone. It's because we have a and we suffer from a stigma. Al Handout D, it has been printed and published in America. If you Google in America, it's a very common problem in America and some African countries and some European countries. So people tend to stigmatize the COVID and people who have COVID. So it's very important as part of educating people about COVID, we have to enlighten them about how to avoid stigma. We have to make a video in different modality. Video it will give, tell you about what you should do and shouldn't do. To help mitigate and palliate the stigma. Hi, my name is Cassie and I'm 16 years old. I've seen on social media that the new coronavirus outbreak has provoked a lot of social stigma and discrimination. This is harmful to not only those who suffer from it, but for everyone. Stigma can isolate people. It can drive people to hide their illness to avoid discrimination. Hi, my name is Cassie and can and even I'm prevent years them old. from seeking medical I've care. I've seen on social media so it is that very the important new coronavirus to... outbreak has provoked a lot of social stigma and discrimination. This is harmful to not only those who suffer from it, but for everyone. Stigma can isolate people. It can drive people to hide their illness to avoid discrimination and can even prevent them from seeking medical care. So it is very important to avoid stigmatizing people. 
And we can all do this. How? Basically, by understanding that words matter. Do talk about the new coronavirus, but don't attach locations or ethnicity to the disease. Do talk about pe people who have or may have COVID-19, people who died after contracting COVID-19, but don't refer to the people with the disease as COVID-19 cases or victims. Do talk about people acquiring or contracting COVID-19, but don't talk about people transmitting COVID-19, infecting others, or spreading the virus, as it implies intentional transmission and assigns blame. Do speak and share accurate information about risk from COVID-19, but don't repeat or share rumors that are not confirmed or language that spreads fear. Do talk positively and emphasize the effectiveness of preventative measures, such as hand washing, but don't emphasize or dwell on the negative or threatening messages. Most importantly, do good. Use your social media account to spread facts and solidarity. This will help us to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, the slide, then I will conclude my talk. It was a long session, hour and a half. Uh, thank you for attending the session, and I hope you are useful. Uh, in summary, plan on how to prepare your PD, how to triage patients, how to assess and resource a patient, and how to manage your patient, and how to manage stigma and fear. Uh, the Heber School Home, uh, for attend uh, I would really like to thank you for attending this session. I hope it, 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 it was useful for you. And I'm going to share the video on my page on the National Regard University Student uh, uh, Alumni Group as Association website and on the YouTube, okay? Along with all videos, thank you so much.